Good evening. Uh, I greet you in the name of our Christ who does all things well. Uh, it's certainly a beautiful day and I thank God for his grace and his mercy that has brought us to this to this point as we come for no other purpose but to reason from the scriptures and to study uh, God's word and that we might be strengthened uh, while we tabernacle here in this body and on this earth waiting for the Lord to return. I want to say to all of you who are listening tonight that God is still on the throne and I know that there are times when we feel that perhaps uh, we're living uh, in a world that is tossed upside down. God foresaw of all of this before it happened. This pandemic, God is going to get us through it and at some point in time we're going to return to the uh, normal sea of, of worship service. But until then I ask that you would continue to pray for our church and continue to support uh, the ministries of the church. For those of you um, who know friends that may not know at this point in time that we are broadcasting through social media. We invite uh, uh, you to tell them and ask them to tune in on Sunday mornings at 1045 and on Wednesday nights at uh, 7 o'clock. A few weeks ago, I was here doing the uh, Bible lesson and uh, one of the younger members of our church uh, stayed over and talked with me for a uh, uh, while and during our conversation uh, we talked about younger people and uh, getting them more involved in the church and how to reach them, how to retain them and, by, and at the same time how to teach them the Word of God and he listed uh, several things that he thought would be uh, beneficial. Uh, one of the things he said uh, is that we need to listen to what young people are saying even if we don't agree with them. Uh, I'm a firm believer that there should be no generation gaps in the body of Christ. But based upon our conversation from a few weeks ago with this young gentleman, I uh, uh, was praying about the situation uh, and uh, I thought of a young lady that uh, is very uh, uh, sound in her belief uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ and I thought that I would invite her to come and speak to our church audience tonight and to the audience that's that's listening across uh, the states the city etc but let me just tell you a little something about her uh, uh, before I present her to you tonight uh, her name it's Ashley Scott. Uh, her church membership is the City Church of New Orleans. Uh, she has quite a bit of experience uh, with working with youth and with young adults. She's a fourth grade teacher at the Bishop McMinnis uh, Academy. Uh, she uh, is a graduate of Hale County uh, School System, Greensboro High School West Campus. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in elementary education from Phoenix uh, University. And she recently founded her own company, which uh, <laughs> I say a lot for a young person doing that. And the name of her c company is Uncaged Living. Uh, which focus on teaching individuals on how to become what God wants them to to be. Uh, she's a deacon in the church, and I failed to mention that. But her parents, uh, are st residents of Hale County, uh, Jimmy and Ronnie Scott, uh, and she's my niece, <laughs> and I'm so glad to have her here uh, tonight. And before Ashley comes to, uh, to share with us, 
what the Lord has given to her. Let us just have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another day that you have blessed us to be alive and given us uh, opportunities that we may not have had before. And, and Lord, especially those who don't know you, you have extended your grace through this day that they might become uh, acquainted with you on a personal basis. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the church and we thank you for the membership that's at large and ask that you would be with them uh, today as you have been all along. And God, we pray for those who are who are sick among us that you would uh, continue to touch and heal their bodies. We pray for our senior citizens uh, of this church and senior citizens across the country. Lord, we pray for those who have been touched by the coronavirus and who have lost uh, loved ones and we pray for those who are sick and we pray heavenly father that your healing virtue would touch them and that they will be healed we pray for the hospitals and for the health care workers that are working with them at all levels and god we pray for this country we are in the midst of a lot of unrest now but lord our faith in you leads us to believe that you would still work things out. In Jesus' name, we ask this prayer. Amen, amen, and amen. Now, let us hear a word from Miss Ashley Scott. <clears throat> Well, hello everyone, how are you doing? My name is Ashley Scott and I am so happy to be with you here tonight. I want to just thank Pastor David Bennett for this opportunity to speak to you tonight and to just really just talk to you about what's really on my heart and what the Lord has given me in this particular season. And I just wanna thank my Bishop, Bishop Owen McManus Jr. and Pastor Tammy McManus and my spiritual parents, Pastor Ryan, Kari Bourgeois, thank you so much for all of the impartation that you have put inside of me. And I thank you for just walking along with me and helping me to become who I am today. So everybody, let's go ahead and let's get started. Um, tonight, I'm gonna be talking to you about uncaged living. And um, Pastor David Bennett, he mentioned that that was one of the um, organizations companies that I started this past year in January and I believe that this is such a timely message and a timely word and that the Lord is really going to just work in your life and move in your life like never before so everybody um, let's just open up just in a quick word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you, Lord God, for this word. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you would just, Father God, anoint my words. Let them be clear, Father God. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you would just anoint me, Lord. Anoint our heart and our ears to receive, Father God, what it is that you want us to hear tonight. We thank you for all these things, and we pray this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Life has a way. Are making you feel caged. Well, it is from society's expectations, it's from fear, or maybe it's from hurts and pains, or maybe even failures or disappointments. But the truth is, God, He never intended for you to live like this. God intended for you to live life to the fullest and to really become who He's called you to be. John 10:10 10, 10 says, A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, he wants to kill, and he wants to destroy. But I, this is Jesus speaking, I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect in life, life in its fullness until you overflow. And so we see here in John 10.10, 10, God has an intention for your life. But also Satan, the enemy, he has an intention for your life. And we have to be aware of that or we will fall into the traps and the ploys and the scheme of the enemy that will derail us from our purpose in life. And it will also derail our identity. So this is why we're talking about uncaged living tonight, because I know firsthand what it feels like to live a life that's caged. 
I praise the Lord that he's delivered me and that he has so worked in my life that he's allowed me to be uncaged now. But now it's not just enough for me to be uncaged, be uncaged. But I want to see you uncaged and you walking in all that God has for you and becoming all who God intended you to be. So how do you live uncaged? There are some things that you have to put into motion, some things you have to do in order to experience this uncaged living. Number one, you have to be established. You have to be established. When I think of something that's established, I think of the beginning of something. And if you're going, you're building a house, you want to make sure that your foundation is really firm. You want to make sure that you have a firm and a sturdy foundation. And when we come into our relationship with God, we are building a firm foundation. There are different ways that we can be established. We can be established through developing a personal relationship with God. I can't depend on my mom's God. I can't depend on my dad's God or my grandmother's God. I have to know God for myself. And what happens is when you build this personal relationship with God, so much comes from it. God starts to speak to you. He starts to give you perspective about your life. He gives you perspective even about the different situations that you're going through. So when, you're, when you want to be established, number one, you have to build a relationship with God. Number two, you have to be established in the word of God. When you're establishing the word of God, then it means that you're putting your foundation on a solid foundation because everything else in this world may change. There's so many different trends, especially in this generation. There's a trend one day, it's a trend tomorrow, it's a trend a month from now, but they change consistently. But we know to be true that the word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It never changes, so that means we can stand on it. We can actually stand on the Word of God, and we can allow the Word of God to, to give us guidance and to give us direction in our life. But we have to be establishing in it. So a relationship with God, establishing the Word of God, you have to also be established in praise and worship. And I'm not just talking about singing a song. We can sing songs all day long. But do you understand the words in the song? Do you understand what each lyric in the song means? Are you just singing it just to pass time? Or are you singing because you want to come into the presence of God? Because in the presence of God, there is liberty. There is freedom. There is fullness of joy. But if we don't even tap into his presence, then we're not even coming into a place where we can hear from God and we can allow God to come and move in our situation. There's times where I have been through so much in my life, but I knew that if I could just lift my hands and worship, that I could come out of it. Because the presence of God will come down and he will deliver you. He will heal you. He will so just turn your situation around. But you have to be established in, the, in praise and worship, knowing how to enter into his presence so that you're also learning how to be led by his presence. You're learning how to flow with his presence. Fourth, what else do you have to be established in? You have to be established in your identity. So many people, especially young people in this world, but not just young people, but it's, there's a lot of people, they don't know who they are. And they have this question, who am I? So they look to social media, they look to these artists, they look to all these different things to tell them who they are. But yet, no matter what they try to do, no matter how much they try to identify themselves with that, or maybe maybe it's not social media, maybe it's, it's not those different artists, but maybe you're using your job to become your identity, maybe your success, maybe your education and your degree. You cannot identify yourself with those things because those things are not sturdy. Those things are not a firm foundation and they change every single day. And no matter how much you try to build your identity in that, you will always feel like it's never enough. You will always feel as if you're, if you feel as if you have a void inside of you because now you're using these different things to give you identity when your identity comes from Christ alone. 
So yes, you have to know your identity. Yes, you have to you have to have that personal relationship with God. Yes, you have to be founded in the word of God. Yes, you have to know how to come into the presence of God by doing praise and worship. But fifth, you have to know what your purpose is in life. Because guess what? If you don't know who you are and you don't know what you're called to do, you will allow somebody else, you will allow someone else to now define you. You will allow someone else to tell you who they think you should be. And I've been in that place too many times in my own personal life. And it leaves you in a place of frustration. It leaves you in a place to where you, you feel this pressure. You feel just how we talked about, you feel that cage. Because now you're becoming what other people want you to be. You're becoming what others want you to be and it never gives you true fulfillment. Only becoming who God intended you to be gives you true fulfillment. And operating in who God has called you to be gives you true fulfillment. So you got to be established, everybody. The Bible has a verse and it's Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 to 27. And this talks about what in, what the importance of a firm foundation. It says, everyone who hears my teachings and applies it to his life can be compared to a wise man who built his house on an unshakable foundation. When the rains fell and the flood came with fierce winds beating upon his house, it stood firm because of its strong foundation. So guess what? If you're not establishing Christ, you don't even have a firm foundation. You're wondering why every time I go to build something, it's it's, it's, it's as if I'm losing everything that I'm building. It's because your foundation is on something that's other than Christ. And when you're built upon a foundation other than Christ, it is unstable. You are tossed to and fro like the waves of the sea, unstable in all your ways. And you cannot build something. You cannot advance forward because you don't have that firm foundation. So uncaged living, it's not just a nice little trendy thing, trendy thing to say. Uncaged living is the way that God intended for you to live. Because so many times we live so far beneath what God has for us. We haven't even fully tapped into what God has for us. So we have to be established. And once you're established, you have to be equipped. You have to be equipped and you have to allow God to use all these different things to equip you. One, some definitions for equip is to supply with the necessary items for a particular purpose, to prepare mentally for a particular situation or task. It also means to make ready or to qualify. That means that if it was just enough for me to be established, then I wouldn't have to do anything else. But having a relationship with God, knowing how to come into his presence, you let, allowing the word of God to be a firm foundation in your life, knowing your identity and your purpose, these are just basic things to the Christian walk. This is not where it stops. This is not where it ends. God wants to equip you because guess what? Your establishment has a lot to do with you and God. But in order for God to equip you, it has a lot to do with you and people. And God uses people. He uses your relationships with people. He uses your circumstances. He uses all these different things to equip you and to prepare you. This is a season of preparation. It's a season where God is trying to mold you and shape you into who you're supposed to be. Because guess what? If we were meant to just have to just go throughout this life and have our walk with God, just us and God, then guess what? We wouldn't need anybody else or the church. But guess what? God never intended it like that. God wants you to be connected to the local body of church, the the local body, which is the church. Because if you could do this by yourself, you wouldn't be struggling the way you are. If you could do it by yourself, you wouldn't be going around these cycles and going around the mountain like the children of Israel. 
But this is why we have to be connected. We have to allow God to connect us to the local body of church, the body of Christ. And when we're connected to the church, God is so faithful that he will send people into your life. But the thing is, that when you are being equipped, this is like a process. And many of us, many of us, we don't like the process. You know why? Because it does not feel good. It will stretch you. It will challenge you. Sometimes it will even crush you. It will so make you, it, it will push you beyond your comfort zone. But guess what? You need the process in order to grow. If you think about a butterfly, everybody loves to see butterflies. They're so beautiful. But they didn't start that way. They started out as a caterpillar, and then they go into the, um, the chrysalis and the cocoon, and they're, they're staying there, and they're asleep for a, a good little bit. And being a teacher, I actually had the opportunity to watch this process with my class. And once they're asleep and they're ready to wake up, and it's time for them to break out of the cocoon and become that butterfly, everybody wants to think that, look, this process is going to be so beautiful. It's going to be so glorious. But guess what? When the, when, when the caterpillar breaks out of that cocoon, it's a very bloody process. It's a very painful process. But look at what came out of it. Something so bloody and painful, how can something beautiful come out of it? And that's exactly what the process does for our life. If we're not careful, what was meant to be a stepping stone in our life, to propel us into our destiny, into what God has called us to be to help mold and shape us into who we're supposed to be. If we're not careful, we will abort the process and the very thing that was meant to be a stepping stone will now become a stumbling block in our life. And it'll become a foothold for the enemy to have an open door to come into your life. I can tell you this right now, the enemy is not your friend. He does not like you. And he wants to do everything in his power to destroy you and to derail you. Until we wake up and we come to a realization of that, then by default, we're allowing the enemy to come into our lives and steal, kill, and destroy, and taking everything that God meant for us. So you have to be equipped. I have a story, one that looking back is funny, but in the moment going through it, it wasn't funny. But for me, I'm a teacher. I teach fourth grade. I've been teaching for about eight years now. And I would love to sit here and tell you that it has always been such a wonderful, glorious time of teaching. But I'll be honest with you. The only reason I started teaching is because my bishop asked me, have you ever thought about teaching? And they gave me a job in school. For about two years, my first two years, I was trying to find a way to stop teaching and to get out of teaching because I wanted to do something else. Because guess what? I had received these prophecies and different things. Oh, you're going to preach. You're going to go speak in conferences around the world. You're going to do this and that. And I'm like, what in the world does teaching have to do with that? What does children have to do with that guy? I don't understand. And it's amazing how the process that God has for you to go through, it is catered especially to you. So guess what? You can't look at somebody else's life and say, oh, why, did I, why am I going through what I'm going through? They didn't have to go through it. Guess what? They don't have the same walk that you have. They don't have the same purpose and calling that you have. So guess what? Your journey and your path is going to be different from them. So you have to really, when you're going through this process and you're allowing God to equip you, you have to make sure that you are spending time with God. You're getting in the presence of God so that God can speak to you. And when he speaks to you, he's going to give you perspective about your situation. Because guess what? Everything bad that happens isn't always bad. Sometimes it is just a part of the will of God for our lives because it's meant to help us 
grow into who he has intended us to be. We looked at the definition for equip, and one of them was to prepare you mentally. If God were to give you what you wanted right now, you wouldn't be ready for it because you're not mature enough. So God has to prepare us mentally. God has to prepare us because it's just like you have a six-year-old. I just want to bless you, so I'm going to give you the keys to your own car. It sounds like a good idea, but is the six-year-old mature enough to drive the car? No, they're not. And this is what happens. You have to go through the necessary process that God has for you to go through. Or if you receive it before time, before you're mature enough for it, before you learn what you needed to learn in the lesson, the very thing that you want that was supposed to be a promise to you will become a destruction to you. And it will utterly destroy you. And it will eventually kill you. This is why you have to submit to God's timing. You have to submit to God's seasons because we cannot get ahead of God. We can't just say like, you know what, God, I got my relationship with you. God, I'm worshiping you. I'm reading my word, but God, you know, I have some issues in my heart. I don't want to deal with them right now. I don't want to acknowledge them. I just want to move forward and say, praise the Lord. No, God wants you to deal with those things in your life. Because guess what? The, when, you, you, when you become established, that's just a firm foundation. The firm foundation is just the outs, it, it's, it's the, what the, it's, it's the actual structure of the house. It's, it's the foundation. It's very flat. And you have like some pillars or whatnot that are attached to the foundation so that the house doesn't fall. But guess what? When you allow God to equip you, now you're starting to build up that structure. And guess what? For many of us, our structure is not whole. Our structure is very broken. Our structure is very shattered. Our structure has cracks in it. And we think that just because we have a relationship with God, we go to church every single Sunday. We do all these different things that guess what? I'm okay. Guess what? The enemy it's not afraid of somebody who goes to church. The enemy is not afraid of somebody who does the religious things. You know what makes him take notice? It's somebody who knows who they are. They know their identity. They walk in their authority. They know what their purpose is in life. They, instead of allowing generational curses to tell them who they're supposed to be now they're actually renouncing those generational curses and saying guess what it stops with me that's what the enemy is afraid of he's afraid of christians who are powerful not christians who are powerless and one thing we need to realize is that when we are broken when we don't deal with the issues inside our heart when we don't allow those relationships and whatnot that God wants to use in our life to help mature us and help develop us into who we're supposed to be take place, then what we're doing is we are stopping God from moving in our life. So I freshly started teaching and I had a supervisor. She has this one tone of voice, y'all. So. She just talk loud, but it sounds like she's screaming at you. It's just her one tone of voice. But she would tell me things to try to help me in the classroom. And you know what? Because I had some things in my heart that I haven't dealt with that have been in my heart since I was younger. Feelings that I never was good enough. I never was worthy enough. All these different things. But you grew up in church your whole life. The enemy can lie to you. And you can believe those lies and those strongholds and they can become your truth if you're not careful. So I'm in the classroom, she's trying to help me, but every time she talks to me, all I hear, nothing you do is ever good enough. And it's, I'm getting frustrated, I'm getting defensive, and it's amazing how it took me getting sick where I couldn't do anything where I had to, I was inside for probably like a week and a half, I was sick. I had acute um, tonsillitis and acute synonitis. I had to go to the ER and everything. 
But in the time that I was sick, I was just laying on my back and just couldn't do anything. All I could do was just lay down. God started speaking to me. And he started telling me about the root that was in my life and how I was taking, I was becoming defensive. I was taking offense to different things that happened. And what it was, it was, it was a lie that the enemy had lodged inside my heart, telling me that I wasn't good enough, telling me that I wasn't worthy enough. And no matter what I did, it was never enough. And it was amazing. After I was able to figure out the root, God was able to restore not only the relationship with my supervisor, but the relationship with my mom as well. And it's amazing how ever since that moment, God completely turned that situation around. Because what would have happened if I would have never dealt with the different issues and the different roots in my heart that were nothing like God? I would have missed an opportunity for God to help mold me and shape me into a better person and to prepare me. I wouldn't be the teacher I am today had it not been for that relationship with my supervisor. And she's like a second mom to me now. But the thing is, we miss opportunities. We miss seasons and open doors because we don't want to deal with the brokenness and the issues in our heart. And we're allowing the enemy to stop us. God, so those things, those things that happen in your life, they're not meant to destroy you. They're not meant to bag you up against the wall and make you feel as if you can't do anything. They are meant to draw out what is inside of you. And you know what? Drawing out what's inside of you, sometimes it's the good things of God and sometimes it's the things that look nothing like God. So many times, especially in our society today, we, we tend to think that our enemy is who is on the outside of us. But you know who your greatest enemy is? It's not even the enemy. It's not even the devil. You know what's your greatest enemy? Your greatest enemy is what you allow to remain on the inside of you that is not like God. The enemy is not making you do anything. He just dangles stuff in front of you. And we just take the bait. This is why you have to be established. And it's not enough to just be established. You have to be equipped and you have to deal with those broken places in your heart. You have to deal with all this brokenness inside of you. Because guess what? While your foundation is firm, how long is your house going to last? It looks good on the outside. But what is going on in the inside of you? You cannot build something with two broken things. Put two broken things together, it does not make a whole. It's broken. The only way you can build together is when you have something whole that comes together with something else that is whole. And guess what? You can, this is, this is the lie and the deception of the enemy is that he makes you believe that because I'm in church, because yeah, I'm doing this, I'm doing that for God. You know how many Christians are in the church, but they are not healed? They're in the church, but they're not healed. Therefore, it makes them powerless. It makes them powerless and by default, it gives the enemy their power because they've given him a foothold into their life. So we have to make sure that guess what? I'm not just building my relationship with God. I'm not just reading the word of God. I'm not just doing praise and worship. I'm not just knowing who I am. I'm not just walking, like knowing my purpose, but I'm dealing with these broken issues, these different things in my life because it's gonna help me to become whole. You, you are not equipped until you're whole. And guess what? That difficult situation, that heartbreak, that those seasons, it seems as if it's like everything is coming against you and fighting you. Guess what? Those things are developing you and it's helping you to make you whole. You know, we're like, we're like 
we're like an onion. I wanted to bring an onion, but you know, I didn't want my eyes to be like watering and stuff with y'all. But we're like an onion. When you start to peel back the layers of the onion, of course it's gonna like make your eyes water and stuff. I don't know what's in it that does it, but it just does. But what God is doing when you come to him, you're like that onion. We come into onion. And guess what? He starts to peel back all those different layers. He's peeling and he's peeling. Guess what? Because he wants to get to the core of the onion. And you know what the core is? The core is who God intended you to be. Who God ordained you to be. And sometimes life, sometimes even things that we have been like grown up in. Things that we have been taught our whole life. It is contrary to what God's word says and to what God says about our life. So God has to strip us from all those different things. That's why you have to be careful that you you found your life on a firm foundation because you can actually base your life on a lie, not even realizing it, and make it into your own truth. This is why you need the presence of God. You need the spirit of God to reveal that to you. Because guess what? I don't want to walk around life and be passionate about something that is based on a lie. So we have to make sure that we allow God to come into every area of our life. Not just the areas that we want him to come into, but even those things that we don't want God to see. One thing I've learned just in my own personal walk, the power of vulnerability. Many times people teach you, it makes you weak. No, it doesn't. Vulnerability makes you powerful. Because you now you're able to, if you can't be vulnerable with God, my goodness, who can you be vulnerable with? And guess what? Just like those relationships that God actually uses to equip us, in the church, they have people called spiritual authority. It's so important for you to be accountable. It's so important for you to be accountable to spiritual authority. For you to be transparent and vulnerable. Because guess what? You need people who you can actually share your heart with. Because what I found many times just talking to people, it brings about healing inside of your life. But you have to allow God, allow God to... You have to allow God to really allow those people access into your life. So, you have to be established to experience uncaged living. You have to be equipped to experience uncaged living. But the third thing that you have to be, you have to be empowered. And when I think about something that is empowered, it's like you have something on the inside of you that you can give yourself. Mark chapter 16, 15 talks, is a great example about what happens to people when they are truly empowered by God. And it says this, And he said to them, As you go into all the world, preach openly the wonderful news of the gospel to the entire human race. Whoever believes the good news and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not believe the good news will be condemned. And these miracles and signs will accompany those who believe. Did it say those who go to church? Those who do religious things? No, those who believe. Those who believe in, in God. Those who allow God to come in their life and to make them whole. Because guess what? As long as you're broken, it's very hard to believe in something. Many times, it's easy for us to believe in somebody else more than we believe in ourselves. So, we have to allow God to heal those broken pieces in our life. Because guess what? The fear will leave. All these different things that you're dealing with in your life will leave when you allow God to make you whole. So, what are some of the signs and miracles that follow those who believe? 
Number one, they will drive out demons in the power of my name, the power of the name of Jesus. Because guess what? We cannot do this in our own strength. We cannot do this in our own power. We can, we can be established. We can be whole. But guess what? Are you operating in everything that God had for you? It says they will speak in tongues. The book of Acts talks about the, the day of Pentecost, how God poured out his spirit upon people and they received the gift of speaking in tongues. There's power that comes when you speak in it. Number three, they will be supernaturally protected from snakes and from drinking anything poisonous. Now, if that don't make you excited, I don't know what will. And last but not least, they will lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. But that comes from living an empowered life. You cannot live empowered if you have not been established. And if you have not been equipped, you haven't allowed God to make you whole. Because guess what? You know what makes that house stand through the storm and through the test of time? It's not just the foundation. It's the structure. It's everything that makes up the house. That's what helps that house to stand. But guess what? Once you're whole, now God wants to use you. It's not just enough for you. It's not enough for God to just save you and deliver you and heal you. God wants to use you and he wants to empower you to go and help somebody else. And one perfect example of this is Peter. Peter is actually one of my favorite characters from the Bible. And... This story actually takes place in the book of Acts. And I absolutely love the book of Acts. Because for me, I just love the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's just something about the outpouring of His Spirit. Because when God pours out His Spirit, God is going to move in such a powerful way and lives are going to be changed. So I want to read Acts chapter 3 to you. And this is verses 1 through 15. This is a wonderful story. Maybe some of you might know it um you're very familiar with it but this is the book this is the book of acts chapter 3 verses 1 to 15 but this this is the story about peter and here we have peter and john they are actually going to the temple so that they can pray it's three o'clock in the p.m so let's just read verse one one afternoon peter went to the temple for three o'clock prayer as they came to the entrance called the beautiful gate they were captured by the sight of a man crippled from birth being carried and placed at the entrance of the temple. He was often brought there to beg for money from those going to worship. When he noticed Peter and John going into the temple, he begged them for money. And as I was reading, I was like, God, why was Peter so captured? Because Peter, Peter was looking at this man. He's crippled. He had been like this since birth. So guess what? To everybody else around him and to him, it was normal. That condition that he was in was normal. But Peter was just captured. It's like, so many things that capture your attention are things that's like, that is not normal. That's not the way that it's supposed to be. Or maybe it's weird for that to be there. It's just like trying to find a broom in an oven. That would capture your attention because you don't put a broom. You don't store a broom in the oven. So it says here in verse 4, Peter and John looking straight in the eyes of the crippled man said, Look at us. Expecting a gift, he readily gave them his attention. Then Peter said, I don't have money, but I give you by the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. So guess what? This crippled man, even he had gotten used to his state. He thought it was normal. And it, it just amazes me how all these different people, they would pick him up from the gate beautiful and they would bring him and lay him at the, at the entrance of the temple. I'm like, at some point, did anybody ever think to bring him into the temple? To bring him to God? Because sometimes we can be in such a place. We can, we're we doing all the things that look good. Y'all, it was a good deed that they carried him from the gate to the entrance of the temple. But guess what? 
they were doing their due diligence. But because they did not, they weren't in that place, maybe they, they had different things. They hadn't dealt with, with God. And now it left them in a state to where they were powerless. To where, where they could have, in this moment, done something for that crippled man and helped him out of the state that he was in. They had nothing to do. They had nothing to give him. So all they could do was bring him and lay him at the, at the um, entrance of the temple. So this was so powerful. When Peter told him, look at us, he said, I don't have money, but I give you what I do have. In the power of the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Peter held out his hand to the crippled man as he pulled the man to his feet. Suddenly, power surged into his crippled feet and ankles. The man jumped up. He stood there for a moment, stunned. And then began to walk around as he went into the temple courts with Peter and John. He leapt for joy and shouted praises to God. When all the people saw him jumping up and down and heard him glorifying God, they realized it was the crippled beggar they had passed by in front of the beautiful gate. Astonishment swept over the crowd, for they were amazed over what had happened to him. Dumbfounded. Over what they were witnessing, the crowd ran to Peter and John, who were standing under the covered walkway called Solomon's Porch. Standing there also was the hill beggar clinging to Peter and John. With the crowd surrounding him, Peter said to them, People of Israel, listen to me. Why are you so amazed by this healing? Why do you stare at us? We didn't make this crippled man walk by our own power or authority. The God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had, has done this. For he has glorified his servant Jesus, the one you denied to Pilate's face, when he decided to release him. And you insisted that he be crucified. You rejected the one who is holy and righteous and instead begged for a murderer to be released. You killed the prince of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we stand here as witnesses to that. Faith in Jesus' name has healed this man standing before you. So, here, this, this is a powerful story. Because they didn't understand that the only way to bring this crippled man out of his broken state was for him to experience the power of God. And what's so powerful is that, guess what? Peter didn't just speak over his situation, but Peter reached his hand down and pulled the crippled man out of his crippled state into a place of healing. We have to be empowered. We have to be empowered by the Spirit of God so that we... It, and when you're in power, you have to be whole because guess what? I cannot bring somebody out of a broken state if I'm broken myself. I have to be whole. I have to allow God to make me whole so that I can be in power to now, just as Peter did, reach down, not just speak over that. Speak over that situation and speak life. But I have to reach down and get alongside with them. That's why you have to be careful who you who you connect yourself with. You need to be connected, linked up with people who that if you are weak, they can pull you up. If they're weak, you can pull them up. But you need to have somebody where iron sharpens iron. And that's where God wants us to be. I believe today that God is speaking to so many different people and that God is really challenging us. He's telling us, step up. Step into the place that I called you to. Don't just do the things that are mundane. Don't just do the things that look good. But you know what's even better than looking good? It's actually being good. And being whole. And being who God's called you to be. So many times we have different hashtags in this world. And everybody wants to hashtag everything, especially in this generation. Well, I got a hashtag for you. Hashtag uncaged living. Hashtag become who God intended you to be. Hashtag establish. Hashtag equipped. Hashtag empowered. Hashtag now that's savage. You know, 
Hashtag breaking down generational curses. Hashtag pulling down strongholds in your life. Hashtag knowing who you are and walking your in your identity, knowing your purpose. That's what's savage. That's the thing that's going to change this world and that's going to leave a legacy. But the thing is, we have to readjust and reprioritize our priorities. Refocus yourself. It's not, it's not by chance that we've been in this season of COVID-19. Everybody's had to quarantine. People couldn't go to work. You had to be at home longer than what you had to. Guess what? God was ha- letting you have this time so you can deal with those things that you have been too busy to deal with. You can deal with that brokenness. You can deal with all those different things. Guess what? It don't just have to be things that are bad. It can be even those good things. Deal with those things. Because guess what? God wants you to come out better than what you were going into COVID. My bishop, Bishop Owen McManus Jr., he told us this in one sermon. He said, you should be better after COVID than you ever were going into it. If you did not change, if something within you did not change, you did not make the most of this opportunity in this season. And you see, we have Peter, Peter, the man for the hour. He reached down and helped that man out of a broken, crippled state into a place of healing. But guess what? Peter wasn't always like that. Just a couple of chapters before this, Peter denied Christ. He denied Christ three times. And after Christ went to the cross and he died, they put him in the tomb. Just before he resurrected, Peter went back to doing what he did before. He went back to his place of comfort. He went back to fishing. And guess what? He was fishing all night and he got nothing. He toiled all night and he got nothing. For many of you, you are toiling and you are working. You are trying to work things out for yourself and it's getting you nothing. Because if you would just get in alignment with what God has for your life, if you would just get in alignment with what God is trying to do in this season, then things will fall in place. Things will flow the way that God wanted them to. If we will stop fighting God and stop fighting this process, then God will have his way and his work in our life. So Jesus comes and he finds, he finds Peter. He finds him. And while he's out there fishing, he's like, put Put the net on the right side. So he puts it on the right side. And lo and behold. Now he has this big. This yield of fish. It's overflowing so much y'all. That the net doesn't even rip. Now anybody who goes fishing. And who does this for a living. You know that the net can rip a lot of times. But guess what. That just shows us when we give our life to Jesus. And we trust him. And we follow him. And we do what he's called us to do. He will bring in such a harvest. That you won't lose anything. Your net will not rip. You will overflow so much in abundance that it will overflow into the lives of other people. But that's only if you follow him. Peter had to learn how to follow Jesus. Not just walk with him. Not just do the things that look good. Peter had to learn how to know Jesus for himself. But more importantly, Peter had to learn who he was. Because he had an identity problem. This why this is why he didn't know what to do after Jesus left. Because he had found his identity in Jesus' ministry. And not found his identity in Christ. So here, Jesus tells Peter this to man. He tells him to do this when he restores him. He tells him, follow me. I know it don't look good. I know you don't know how everything's going to work out. But he says, follow me. He tells Peter to follow me. Even though things, you had unexpected things happen. You didn't think that they were going to crucify me. But follow me. Trust me. And that's what he's saying to many people today. As I was preparing for this, there was a song that came to my mind. And one of my favorite singers is Tasha Cobbs. And she has this song called For Your Glory. And it says, for your glory, I will do anything. And it talks about how I want to be where you are. And I believe that today, that's a prayer that many of you have today. 
I want to be where you are, God. Even if it doesn't look the way I think it should look, even if it doesn't feel the way I think it should feel, even if it's not in accordance with how I think it should be, I just want to be where you are, God. There were three people God wanted me to pray for tonight. The first group of people, you're just like Peter. You've been struggling with identity issues. You've been struggling with all these different things. And guess what? You've been toiling and toiling. And you've been doing things in your own strength. But guess what? You've got nothing. You have nothing to show for it. You base your identity in things that are fallible. You put your identity in things that are not going to sustain you. They have no substance. God is telling you today, follow me. Follow me because guess what? In my hands, you are in the best care. Why not follow the person who created you? The person who knows why you were even put here on this earth. The second group of people. God's telling you today is the day that you confront the broken pieces of your life. You confront those different things and you stop aborting the process because the only person that you're hurting is you. If you're not careful, you're going to end up like the children of Israel, that first generation who didn't even get to go into the promised land because they doubted God's ability. And they eventually doubted Moses' ability because they allowed fear to rise up in their heart. They had different issues and matters in their heart that they did not deal with. God is talking to you today, and he's telling you, if you would bring me the broken pieces of your life, I would bring healing, I would bring restoration, I would make you whole. And then he's talking to the third group of people. You've been established. You're whole, but you're not empowered. God wants to empower you today because guess what? He wants to use you to touch somebody else's life. So if, that's, if, if you feel that the Lord is speaking to you, I want you to raise your hands. Not just one hand, raise both hands wherever you are, in your home, in your car, wherever you are, as a sign of surrenderance. Saying, God, I can't do this by myself anymore. Lord, I surrender. I surrender to everything that you're calling me to. I surrender, God, to what you call me to do. God, I surrender my brokenness, Lord God. Even the things that people don't know about. He cares for you and he wants to carry your burdens. And he wants to give you his yoke, which is so much easier to carry. But you got to come to him today. You got to trust them. You have to follow him. So everybody, just close your eyes. We're going to pray. Repeat after me. Lord God, I thank you today for this word, Father God, about uncaged living. Lord, I pray today that you will uncage those things inside of me. I pray that you, Father, will forgive me for trying to work things out on my own. Lord, I surrender today. I yield to your will. I yield to your way. Make me whole today, Lord. Save me. Heal me. Deliver me. Lord, I thank you for every person watching tonight. I thank you for their lives, Father. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you will so just heal them, Father. That your presence, Lord God, will go before them, Lord God, and that you will deliver them, Father God. That every stronghold of the enemy, Lord God, we take authority over and we pull them up in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Lord God, we rebuke every scheme and supply of the enemy off of their lives, Father God. And we release truth, Father God. The truth of your word, Father God. Where there is truth, there is freedom and there is liberty. So Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, we declare and we, we just declare over everyone's 
life, Father. And I pray, Father God, that from this day forward, Lord God, that they will be established, that they will be equipped, and Lord God, that they will be empowered, Father God, to become all that you call them to be. I thank you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, for changed hearts today, Father, for those who gave their heart back to you, for those who are, they've been walking with you, Father God, but they're going to a new level today, Father, and for those who have given you their broken pieces of their life, I thank you for healing and wholeness, Father. We declare these things in the name of Jesus, and I thank you, Lord God, Lord God, that Father, that this is just a season they're passing through, Father, but now they will have perspective and eyes, Father God, to embrace it, Father God. Embrace it so that they can become all that you call them to be. I thank you for all these things, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I pray it has blessed you. I pray more than just a good word that you heard. I pray that it changed you. I pray that you become all that God has for you. And I pray that you will no longer allow the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy that which God has given you. Good night.